done two things. Like, is that something your parents might have encouraged, right? Where does that STEM track really get in, incurred? Right? And so how do you change culture? Do we want to make sales and emails the same? Which is weird and not something I might say on my campus, right? Does that make sense, Hannah, or no? It, they're, they're odd questions. Like, these are questions that labor economists sometimes ask. It's like, I don't know how much. I mean, I like the idea of equal opportunity, but like, males and females do seem to have some biological differences. Like, how much do we want to maintain and how much do we want to get rid of while offering the same chances? Have you seen any research into like the effects of the composition of a team, for example, if the inclusion of a woman will make it productivity more efficient than overall? Because there's a lot of soft skills that are like value. So I would wonder if it would be like an intermediary effect that's like a third variable that would directly affect the outcome, but it could exist as like a, you know, like Yeah, a no, no, absolutely. So my feeling is just in terms of modeling, that is going to turn into something that's difficult to do just because you have so many, like, permutations and then also how to gather the data. And that was the big sell on Jeopardy, by the way. And so this was like, it's a three-person panel if everyone's seen it. And so we look at wagering behavior and daily doubles. And based on, because while people select into the show, that's right, Jeopardy players may not be like your average Jeopardy people. Like we might more reflect the people that put it up on Jeopardy. But the assignment of genders on contestants should be exogenous and it shouldn't be predetermined. Right? And so I did select into the show, but I didn't choose to have you as a contestant and you're a female. So that's what we're arguing, some exogeneity there in the assignment. Um, and there it seems like males actually are less risk taking, which is a little bit strange. And females try to anticipate and perhaps take more risk. Right? And so you've got like a male, male, female, male, female, female, or three, like you can envision the different permutations. But those kind of things naturally are tough. Right. It's like, where do those naturally arise? Or like, maybe the females that select in the finance majors, if you have friends that are finance majors, I just think of the guys I know, right? It's like, they may be inherently acting a little different. I mean, I saw the wolf in the Wall Street, right? Perhaps that attracts people to finance. <laughs> yeah, so going back to the long distance. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yeah. So, um, do you have data where it shows whether um, the commuting occurs, like, use, like whether people use private transportation or private transportation? Because that could potentially so, also affect wages if you have spent. Absolutely. You know, so, car. the yeah. way that Dasan and I think are going to, dis to, to define this is if it's a different region. And so, between Comunas, or okay. Entre Comunas, is, is less distance. So but, they just use more the private car, their own car? And then yeah, my feeling is, is just, again, so like I've now been on the ground a couple of days. Yeah. But the distance is to get to Montefagasta to Santiago, this is prohibitive for for car commute. Yeah. And so, at least from what I saw in terms of ticket prices, I think that it's like, at least on JetSmart, that's what I'm flying tomorrow, or Sunday, it's like $20 yeah. plus luggage. Yeah, yeah. Right, and so I'm... I don't know if the amenities are really that much less in Antofagasta relative to Santiago or about the But the data set has that information, whether people fly or... No, we don't know that. So, so this is generally cars. just okay. like, it's, it's not census data, it's geared towards information on income, but it captures some things in terms of like where they reside and then also where they earn income, plus a lot of other demographic controls. I'm sure we can discuss what we're doing. Break date again.
So, last night I put together um, a slideshow because everyone else had a slideshow. And, <laughs> and Mason kept uh, asking me by email, Joseph, when are you going to send me your slideshow? And I, sa I kept saying, uh, well, I don't have one. And so I, I felt very le left out yesterday. So, uh, so, so I created one. Um, now, so I have a, I'm a scholar of, re of religion. My focus is on transnational Catholicism, especially with a focus on the 20th century and, and uh, black Catholicism in the US. And um, you, I, I decided really to come to Chile uh, because, um, well, first of all, since I was very young, I wanted to come to Chile. And I developed a project really around that. Um, but as it, as it turns out, this is the perfect place. Um, because uh, I'm, I'm doing work that touches on history and geography um, and philosophy. I'm teaching a course in history on, um, uh, at, at Pontific uh, Pontificia Universidad Católica in, uh, in the Department of History. And it's going to be on uh, politics and religion in the United States. And when I landed, my uh, just last week, my energy was not really focused on this project. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about actually an article that I just started to write, and that's where my energy is right now. And then I'll, if I have time, I'll talk to you a little bit about the the my my official project, the one that I'm working on. So uh, when I came in, I started to take photographs of some of the protest art. And I was especially interested in the religious protest art. Now, this is not necessarily my area of expertise or anything. Um, but I thought that I needed to capture it, because one of the things that's happening is that it's changing every day. Uh, most of this is down at uh, GAM, uh, Centro GAM, which is basically a uh, center for culture that was uh, put up in the, during the Pinochet era. Um, and, and today it's kind of like the site over the contestation of, of, uh, of meaning of public space. Um, so let's see if I can, I really don't know how to use a laptop, I guess. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, poster is up up there as well. Along this long wall, people have placed memorials and uh, protest art and graffiti. Obviously, there's graffiti all over the city, but this is a place where a lot of people have gathered. Uh, when I got here on Friday, a lot there, there's a lot of art up, um, and just the I think just the day before or two days before, uh, the art that was previously up was torn down and painted over by, by counter-protesters. So this is basically, um, it's really a, a place where public meaning is being contested. Um, and this, this is obviously uh, really represents the general anger of the population. Now, so these memorials are, um, what, part of the context, I think, what some, some of this is important, the relationship between uh, the art and religion, is that, well, the context is one of secularization uh, um, in Chile, which has been a, a big topic of conversation. Um, also, uh, anger against the, the Roman Catholic Church, especially because of the abuse crisis um, in Chile. And a lot of the protests have really talked about or connected um, uh, sexism and, and political power. And that's been like an important theme. So the, uh, so the, the sex abuse scandal um, has been sort of like an point, important point of, you know, in all of this. So um, Right down the street from my where I'm staying, uh, a church was basically completely looted, and the materials in the church were taken out to use as firewood, uh, you know, the pews and everything. So this is just like two blocks away from where I am. You know, there 
there's a, definitely a lot of anger. There's graffiti that says Dios no existe and like um, you know all of this. So it, even actually, um, the church that I just went to this Ash Wednesday, um, very immigrant population. There are um, you know satanic symbols uh, inscribed on the church. So obviously there's a lot of anger around this, but it's hard to kind of attribute a single kind of ideology to any of the, the use of, of art and religion. Um, because protesters include uh, anarchists and leftists and families and the poor and the middle class and rich kids, environmentalists and feminists and LGBTQ, indigenous activists, etc. And among them, Catholics. So I can't really give a, a, a single meaning to this, but I did want to um, capture some of what I think is going on. So here's a, a Negro Matapacos, um, uh, who is who's famous. This I'm just going to describe maybe like three types of of uh, religious art in particular. Now this this one is not necessarily religious, but there's like kind of you know a little burning bush behind a the dog, but in other cases you do have these uh, these images, um, and this is an example of what I what I might consider camp uh, camp art. It's obviously taking um, these religious images and giving them a new context, but it's usually a kind of ironic context. The whole point of camp is that it's not that deep. It's a little bit tacky, and and uh, and that's that's the beauty of it. And there's a lot of that that's up. I really like this one. It's a, it's very it's beautiful. But you, but you have uh, Negro Matapacos, uh, you know, with the Sacred Heart and the Halo. But there's a lot there are a lot of different kind of camp halos down there. This is one. Uh, and so so what what's great about this this piece of art and the reality is there's a lot of art that's down there that's like this. There's nothing in this that really speaks to the social situation. Um, there's, but what it's doing is it's taking religion out of a per certain context and giving it a new one. Um, it only makes sense because Jesus is presented with the face of Keanu Reeves surrounded by dogs. And because of the John Wick movies where the main character played by Reeves um, goes on a rampage of retribution after his dog is killed. Um, and so this kind of art is great um, because it's ironic, it's in poor taste, it's, uh, you know, and, and I, like, I like it a lot. <laughs> um, you know, this actually has some kind of uh, political content here. Um, so I'm forgetting her name right now, uh, the, the artist, uh, uh, Rocio, Rocio Beas, who's, at, who's a professor at University of Chile, and she does a lot of this uh, kitsch and camp art as well. And so her art is represented there. Um, oh, so this is, I think, I think this is Beas right here. And so this does kind of have a, a sort of political content because it's appealing to the, um, the saints. And this is what uh, Beas says, that she draws from Catholic saints to depict her saints. Um, and so they take, yeah, um, so, but there are other kinds of art here that I think are important. Um, some of them, the wall includes memorials to those who have died, tributes to those who have been injured, alongside non-ironic images of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So this is a place also of public mourning and remembrance. The memorial joins space and time because it links those who are earlier in the history of, of Chile, um, uh, like Victor, Victor Jara, and the musician was tortured and killed uh, uh, during the Pinochet regime, um, and other figures of history um, with other people, like uh, an indigenous activist who was uh, killed by police in 2006, um, 
and Mauricio Freires, who died just uh, you know weeks ago, running away from the Carabineros. So he's linked to kind of a history of struggle. Um, you, you can see this here, names of people who have recently been injured seriously or have, have died. And so these are non-ironic uses of religion and rather kind of heartfelt. This tree basically represents, um, has names of all, all of the people who have uh, uh, been, died through, throughout history or uh, they're, they're the martyrs. There's another, there's a third um, kind of image here as well. And so it's relevant that amidst all of these images, there's art that appeals directly to Christian themes and expresses the need for justice. Uh, so here's, here's one. Do not pardon them because they know perfectly well what they do. Um, it's taking, taking the words of, words of Jesus and, and the scriptures, and it's changing them a little bit, but not necessarily really changing their meaning. Um, and here's another one that I like a lot. Uh, pray for los y las que lucha. Um, pray for those who, who fight. Um, and then this is one, the one that I'll end with. I like this the most. Uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, patroness of the barricades, pr protect us from all evil government. Um, in, in these images, uh, they express a kind of moral ar argument as a form, also a form of appeal to religious people in Chile. Um, the state, they argue, is an oppressor, um, but basically, in addition to the graffitied word that you see everywhere, evade, we also have the omnipresent word, dignidad, which appeals to human dignity that has a kind of social purchase. Um, and it is appealing to these ideas of, of transcendence to root this human dignity. And so we have kind of a different forms of, of art. And so I'm sorry I didn't talk at all about my real project here. Uh, this is just what I've been doing for the last couple of days, but I thought um, it would interest you more. on uh, uh, social Catholicism to the 19, uh, mid, mid 20th century. And um, you know, my, my work is focusing on how, uh, how Catholics had to respond to a decolonial situation. And so I, I've done some work in, uh, on France and also uh, uh, Congo, uh, mid, uh, mid 20th century, um, and how uh, Congolese Catholic uh, theologians were responding to uh, de decolonization. And here in Chile, we could say, well, Chile did gain independence, uh, you know, in the early 1800s. But really, the colonial situation continued with forms of settler colonialism uh, and national consolidation that, that took the form of, of uh, colonization as well. And so, uh, there was a need for the Catholic Church in many ways to, that was deeply dependent on and in, embedded with uh, colonization to begin to disassociate itself from colonization um, or disassociate itself from colonial power. So during the 20th century, there's a big rethinking of what the church is, especially in relationship to the land. And so, that's basically my uh, uh, my project, um, and yeah. Uh, so, yes. I guess, so do you think this graffiti that um, represents religion is is there a call also for the Catholic Church to maybe be more involved and perhaps less participant of the government's decisions and more mm. kind of yeah. Like, uh, well, this this is a uh, yeah this this is definitely a, a critique of of this is interesting. This is sort of like a, a site of um, of argument as well. Uh, 
the Catholic Church's response to the, the, the Pinochet uh, regime. Well, or to, to the current regime. Yes, yes. Um, but, but I think it goes back to, um, to, to some of the same sources. And, and so, what, so one of the questions, I mean, one of the criticisms is that it didn't publicly respond sufficiently to um, uh, the Pinochet era. But it was one of the only free spaces in which um, human rights abuses were documented and, and uh, people were, were protected on some level. And so this, this, there's a, um, you know, after you know, 1990, the, the Catholic Church and, and public opinion had, had a very, like, people regarded it very highly because of the work that it had done during that, that period. And today, the situation is very, is very different. The sex abuse scandal has, um, has really taken at, it out of a, a kind of a leader, uh, position of moral leadership. And, and so that, that's been a, um, you know, a real problem. At, the thing is, is that I think that there are things that are going on that are not necessarily coming out of the, from the bishops. Um, there are Catholic youth that I'm very involved with that, that are like out there protesting. So uh, Pook is a perfect place to, um, to, to kind of be a part of this and sort of try, yeah. try to understand the moment. Exactly. Um, but I have to say that I don't fully understand the moment yet. Um, yeah, but thanks. Um.